But I, I want to peel this apart for a second before we go down. It, data for what purpose, right? There's one of the mistakes that I see a lot of companies make is that they they go down a, a technology led or a data led path that is very expensive and very time consuming and doesn't yield what they hoped it would yield. Welcome to the Delighted Customers Podcast. I'm your host, Mark Slayton, and I'm so glad you're here. I empower leaders to turn indifferent customers into loyal fans. I talk to guests with a wide range of expertise who share meaningful insights and wisdom. We give you practical tips and proven frameworks and share ways to help you delight your customers. So we have a very special guest today. Uh, you may have all heard of Net Promoter System, Net Promoter Score. This is the co-inventor, Rob Markey. Hello, everybody, and, and thanks for having me, Mark. So, so uh, honored to have you as a guest and to be talking about something that really is in your sweet spot, I think, and something you've you've uh, studied and learned about and taught about. And I'm excited to talk specifically about customer loyalty today. And I have a few questions I'd like to ask. So the first question is, how do customers evaluate value and what are the attributes that make customers loyal to a brand? So that's a, there's a lot in that. Um, I think that value, the way that we think about this is value is derived along three basic axes, if you will. Um, there is rational value. That's the stuff that is, what's the product? How, what purpose does it serve? Um, what, what's the pricing? Uh, you know, all of the features and benefits that I'm getting, all the characteristics that are kind of the tech specs or the characteristics of a service. Then there is um, experiential value. That is, what is it like? What does it feel like to buy this, to learn about it, to use it, to get service, to renew, to, you know, all of the interactions that I have and how do those impact my life? Does it feel good? Does it make my life easier? Is it quick and, you know, quick and easy or hard and painful? And then there's um, emotional value. And that is, um, you know, what, what kind of, what is using this product or service say about me? What is the relationship between the brand and my identity or my way of thinking about um, what I value? Does the brand, you know, and, and the, the, the service support my personal values and my um, sense of what matters in the world? So all those things come together to create, and they overlap, by the way, they interact. So you can't just have, you know, great emotional value and crummy rational value. You can't just have amazing rational value and no experiential value. And, and, and in fact, the, the way in which you position your product relative to competitors has to actually be in balance among all three of those dimensions. Now, the other part of your question was, um, what makes a customer loyal? And there, and I just, nothing makes a customer loyal. You earn customer loyalty. Mm. So, you know, what are the, what are the sort of basics of that? Well, um, first of all, you, you know, does the product meet the need at a reasonable price? That's the rational value part. Is it the kind of thing that I really need? Second, does it work the way you said it would and the way I expect it to, not only based on what you said, but based on my expectations from other products and services and brands that I deal with? And then third, when there's a glitch, an issue, a mistake, and you know, do you recover? Do you do something to make me feel like I'm not going to lose trust? Those are things that are required to just meet a threshold of keeping me in, you know, in, in the mix. Competitors can upset some of those things by changing your perception of value by offering something better. 
on the rational dimension or by delivering more, you know, more effectively or more consistently. But you, you won't lose a ton of customers if you're in balance on those. Where you earn real loyalty, where things are really differentiating is when you, um, you deliver something that no one else delivers. You, you have features, benefits, characteristics that are new to world or not typical in your category and they're hard to get from anybody else at that price. Or, and maybe and or, when you deliver the normal stuff in an exceptional or extraordinary way. The example I always give is um, back in the old days, JetBlue was, was a, a perfect example of this. They introduced um, TVs on the seat backs with direct TV links so you could watch live TV. And they did that for free. And nobody in the airline industry was doing that at that time. That was delivering mm -hmm. something that nobody else delivered at a great price. But the other thing JetBlue did was their flight attendants, their pilots, their gate agents, they were all nice and supportive and friendly. And they went out of their way to help people. And, and so, you know, boarding a plane is boarding a plane. But they were nice about it. <laughs> and yeah. that's just delivering what everybody else delivers in an exceptional or extraordinary way. I, you know, sadly, I don't know that JetBlue is as differentiated anymore as it used to be. Um, yeah. But, but I think so, that the, at the time, that's, that was part of what made them successful. Yeah. So Rob just um, shared a ton of wisdom right there. And fortunately, uh, this is recorded so you can play it back as many times as you want, because there's a lot to unpack there. But I have a couple of follow up questions um, that I think might be relevant to the conversation. One, number one is um, the three different uh, parameters or three different areas dimensions um, of value yeah. dimensions rational experiential emotional is what you talked about mm -hmm. um would you expect there to be a difference in the weight of those depending on the industry there absolutely is um and you have choices about how you weight those even within an industry um there's a there's a, a an approach that we use at bain called the elements of value and we have a B2B elements of value and a B2C elements of value. And um, we break down all of the um, dimensions of value that customers derive from products and services into these components that are um, functional, experiential, emotional. Some of them actually even about your identity and things like that. And um, if you want to get really analytic about it, you can do a study <laughs> and try to understand what the what those are and how your elements of value for among your customer base differ from those of people in other categories or brands in your own category but you would expect that insurance is going to have a very different pattern rational experiential emotional than automobiles right it, it just by nature um you know, Amazon is going to look very different from General Electric, of course, or yeah. American Airlines. And, and so um, it's important to think about the balance of the different elements of value, not only relative to your direct competitors, but also the industry and the category that you're in. Yeah. Okay. And, then, and that's kind of what I suppose but um I, I just wanted to press into that and also um as you think about a particular customer as you think about those three areas right customer life cycle so would you expect them to change and evolve over the course of a customer life cycle maybe um i think what any given customer values more or less is going to differ at, at each stage. So when I'm learning about a product or a service, a lot of times all I have that I can rely on are technical specs. That's the rational component, 
right? Yeah. I have a price and technical specs. Yeah. And I might have, um, especially in consumer businesses, I might have some emotional elements of value. Like, you know, what does this brand feel like it fits me and my, my values? But it's really hard from outside in to evaluate the experiential elements of value. And that's where things like recommendations and referrals play a big role. But if you looked at the weighting that a consumer puts or a customer puts on the different ways that they evaluate products or services, it's going to be heavier towards rational before they've bought or even early in the, the new purchase experience mm-hmm. than it will be after two or three or five years of being a customer. So this idea, I'm just going to revert back to the blue ocean strategy, um, where, where you've created a unique offering that no one else has. Um, or like you said, it could be the experience really important. I, I mean, it's hard to do sometimes, but if you think about that, particularly if you're small, you know, it, it could be largely about what you bring to the table. Yeah. And, and, and so if you're talking about like in service businesses where you've, you know, you're just taught you're, you're the, you're the product. <laughs> um, and that's kind of true in my business, right? Like to a certain extent, I, I have a big firm behind me, but I, it's also a lot about the relationship that you form with somebody. Um, I think it's almost, in some ways it's hard because it's, it's harder because you have to be really self-aware and deliberate about how you interact with people and how those interactions reflect the rational and experiential and emotional elements of value that you're trying to um, appeal to with a customer. Mm-hmm. Is, it, is that where you were, you were going with it, Mark? Well, yeah, I think, um, I think if you try, you, you know, it may be a tendency to try to be like everybody else or try to use someone else as the model to then, to then create your own brand. And what you're saying here is, you know, maybe you ought to think about being unique and different, um, and offering something other people don't to differentiate and bring more value. I think that's true. I, I do think that there's there's real value. I mean, especially when you're trying to start up a business or you're tra- you're early in your your career or you're a new business a new industry. There's nothing wrong with learning from others and mm-hmm. um, synthesizing the best of what you see in other people, other companies, other services. I think that you can learn a lot from that. I think the mistake sometimes people make is they copy. Mm. The imitation, especially when you're talking about um, personal interactions, it doesn't come across as authentic or it it, it feels like, it it never just feels, it never feels that good. Yeah, yeah. Well, excellent. Thank you for, for sharing that. I think that's really, really good stuff. There's this um, Oliver's study, um, and the, he did a study on the loyalty, the different types of loyalty, um, starting with cognitive, affect, um, connotative, and action-oriented. And, and it's kind of what you were talking about there, where at first, it's at the early stages of, of becoming loyal, you're thinking with your head, and you're you're observing everything, and you're taking all the information in, and then you move toward, okay, there's some emotional connection that I have with this. And then the connotative, you know, is repeat, you know, you get into the repeat, and it's starting to identify and then the last piece is the action. So the, the third piece, which is kind of an interesting part, which I don't think is, to me, is one of the most interesting parts is <clears throat> to go from connotative to, to action. What he's saying is, you like me, you prefer me, there's an emotional connection. I have an intention to buy, yeah. but I have not committed to you yet until I get to action. What do you think of that? I, I think that's, that's very, very insightful. I even think that um, there's a stage beyond that, right? Which is when, so, so it's important. I I don't want to minimize what, yeah, just the, just the buying process and that commitment to buy, right? 
the commitment to buy again is another thing entirely. And then where you really see something, you know, like a really good relationship is where the buyer um, takes action to convince somebody else to do business with you. Right? That's, that's actually an even higher level of commitment and it would, we would call it advocacy yeah. where um, somebody's putting their own reputation on the line because, because they not only um, learned about, you know, evaluated, bought, but then they had a, such a good experience with the product and service that they felt like they needed to share it with other people. Sometimes even going to great lengths to convince other people against their reluctance or uh, in spite of some, some other objection. That's yeah. So I, I love, I love the framework for getting over the hump with buying. Yeah. I just think it keeps going. Yeah. And I think if I would, if I were uh, to, to be fair to Oliver is that in the action phase, he, they talk about so feeling so some sense, such a strong sense of allegiance to the brand that you would actually defend the brand. Yes. Yes. Yeah. You, yeah. you defend, you forgive. So yes. when there's a glitch or an issue, you're a little more forgiving. Um, you still may hold them accountable to make things right, but it's actually easier when, when, when somebody's reached that stage, it's easier to recover because yeah. you've earned that trust. Yeah. That, what, what now we're getting a little cerebral here, but it, it does come <laughs> up. It does come up in the, in, in, in the readings there is the, the origins I think of, of Oliver's study. He had done an earlier study with some people and it was the previously conceived correlation between satisfaction and loyalty and in this subsequent study, he's saying, actually, you know, as you move more and more through the stages of loyalty toward action and you get into the repeat purchase cycle, they actually start to separate out to the point where even if I have negative satisfaction, it doesn't affect my loyalty. What, how would you respond? Yes, for a while. For a while. Yeah, you you can you can it, it's it's this idea of forgiveness, right? I can be dissatisfied with something for a while, and taking out of the equation for a minute inertia and switching costs and all that stuff, which can hold a customer in repeat purchase cycles for a very long time. Yeah, take that. Imagine you actually there's no friction and you could choose anything. Um, a loyal customer will hold on to something they're dissatisfied for quite a long time sometimes. Um, but they become very vulnerable. And that vulnerability is exploited by a competitor who has news or has a better, you know, like an offer that they make or just happens to strike, you know, get lucky and strike on a day that you're especially dissatisfied. Yeah. And, and Oliver uses that he calls it fortitude, you know, your degree of fortitude for the brand. Uh, yeah. And I like that. I like that idea. I, I, I have to admit, I'm not familiar with, with yeah. the work, so I'm, I'm going to go read it now. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's, it's, you might have to dust it off because to be honest, it's 1999. So it's 24 years old. Uh, but it, it's a framework for understanding loyalty and, 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 a, and, and as, as customers go through kind of their, movement toward more and more loyalty what's going on with them right it sounds it, it sounds insightful and so i'm gonna go dig into it <laughs> all right so let, let's let's move on to the second question which is what's the role of data in crm outcomes you know we're co collecting all this data typically a typical CX person would be like, I've got to get more data. I've got to get the right data. I've got to get. And typically what you find is that the issue is there's no shortage of data. The question is, what do I do with this data? And, and as you think about customers through their life cycle, like how, how can we use the data to impact how they feel about us, how loyal they are to us? Well, it, 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 there's a, again, a lot wrapped up in that. Um, first of all, there may not, there may be no shortage of data, but often 
people are struggling to get the right data or the data mm. that they feel they need in the right format. It can be really hard. It, companies, big companies especially, are just awash in data, but getting your hands on the thing you need can be nightmarishly difficult. So mm. one of the things I see CX leaders and others struggle with is, you know, it's like, well, I need more data or I need this piece of data, but it comes from this system over here that I can't get access to, or that is going to take, you know, they, the IT guys tell me it's you know, going to take 15 months before they can even consider the, you know, it's like uh, very frustrating. Yeah. Um, but I, I want to peel this apart for a second before we go down it, data for what purpose, right? There's one of the mistakes that I see a lot of companies make is that they, they go down a, a technology led or a data led path that is very expensive and very time consuming and doesn't yield what they hoped it would yield. We're going to create um, a customer 360. We're going to get every piece of data into one place and we're going to be able to, or they do um, more, more recently and more effectively, but still sometimes problematic. We're going to tag every piece of data with a unique customer identifier so that we can flexibly go through the entire data set and we can look at any data element any way we want anytime it just takes it takes years to do those things and they're very expensive so i think that i'd start by asking what are the basic categories of data you need well first you need the ability to um, understand the current state of your customer base so um, how often are they interacting with you? What kind of revenue are you getting at the customer level? Uh, how frequently are they purchasing? How big is the order value? What number of different products and what mix of different products are they buying from you over time? Um, how do their purchases change with tenure? All that stuff um, is important. And, and, and I'm being very specific about the things I'm naming, by the way. Uh, this is not just random things. Mm -hmm. These are things that are important for understanding the drivers of customer lifetime value and what's underneath those so that you can understand what's happening with your customer base. How many am I acquiring? How are they performing? Are they getting better or worse than they were before? Is this new cohort of customers worth more or less? All of that stuff. Not necessarily calculating CLV, which I think sometimes is also a Big, a big effort that doesn't yield as much as you wish it would. But understanding the trajectory of different subgroups of customers um, who are coming through the, the business. I think the next thing is to then to say, what are the big events in a customer's lifetime that change the trajectory, that actually deflect the curve one direction or another? So what is the impact of the way we handle a customer complaint. What is the impact of a price change? What is the impact of a product upgrade? All of the, name the things, but the, pick the biggest ones and make sure that you have the ability to identify those and what is going on. So all of that is reporting and diagnostics, data that supports that. The second piece, the second uh, type of data you need is data that allows you to identify specific customers who might need an intervention or a treatment. So these are things like propensity models. Um, when I look at customers with these characteristics who have been offered this or who have been treated this way in an insurance claim, or who had a fee imposed on them after they had a late payment, or what happened? And how can I identify customers who are like them who might behave the same? So propensity models or next best action models. Or... And then the final thing that I think people need is the ability to customize or personalize actions and interventions on a real-time basis. So what is it, who is Mark Slate as he comes through my, my sales team or my service operations? And how does he like to be 
talk to and what products does he own and what do I think, not just what's the next best action product, but how do I, how do I talk to him in a way that makes it more likely that he's going to be open to buying another product? So to me, the, the, the data challenge becomes easier when it's, it's data being collected and analyzed for a, to, in support of a decision or an action. And, and those are the three big categories for me. Is that? Yeah, no, that, that's really helpful as you kind of painted the, the road on a, on a life cycle. Um, and and cer certain industries have like literally over the life of a customer and some are much shorter, right? Well, there's a fundamental difference between um, what you might call subscription or contractual types of businesses and um, businesses that are more ad hoc, right? So when I've got a subscription, the, 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 the most extreme version is a subscription where there's not really an upgrade or additional purchase option. Mm. Um, it, you know, the, 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 maybe an extreme would be um, life insurance. Uh, you know, the life insurance is the life insurance contract. And then I can try to sell you other stuff, but that, that contract is, is pretty stable. And so the revenue is the revenue. Um, and what I'm looking for is renewals. That's the basic thing. Or sometimes, um, you know, cable TV can be like that. It's like flat or ISP, you know, the uh, internet service provider. Yeah. yeah. So um, there, you know, really you're just looking at different groups of customers and asking the question, what do I do to, to sustain that revenue from those, those customers? That's the extreme version. There's a second version, which is like, you have a contractual relationship and, and in order to end the relationship, you have to take action. I have to leave a bank for fully. Uh, but there's a usage component or a, or a, a value piece where like I can put more money into the bank. I can take more, like if I have a line of credit, I can use the line of credit more or less. Um, if I have a credit card, I can use it more or less. Those kinds of things um, require a, a different type of analysis. And then finally, you've got like a retailer, a, a bricks and mortar retailer, or even a, a, an online retailer. I buy when I buy, you know, like I, I, I decide that I want a pair of shoes, right? And is, am I going to buy it from this or that or the other place? Um, the models that you use basically boil down to a, you know, sort of a, a retention model for the extreme subscription. And then for anything that involves discretionary purchase, um, there's this question of, is the customer still alive? Meaning, are they still purchasing? Mm -hmm. And what's the frequency with which they purchase and how much are they spending when they purchase? So it's a, people call it a recency frequency money framework. And um, the data and analytics that you need to project what is happening with a group of customers and what is contributing to their likely future purchases and their therefore estimated lifetime value um, differs slightly. But at the end of the day, it's, it's reasonably simple math. Yeah. And which when you're talking about recency, frequency, and v value, that's really one possible CLV model, right? Yeah. And, and, but I think you don't need to go all the way. I, I've changed my my perspective over time. Hmm. I used to be really well. Twenty five years ago, I was I was building CLV models for my clients, and um, I've been doing that for a really long time. I think that what I've come to realize is that because CLV itself is not used by the finance team, and it doesn't play a role in gap accounting you're you're you get at least as much value or maybe more 
from using the underlying um, forecasting models. So what do I, do I expect Mark Slayton to buy again and, and it, it, with what frequency over what period of time? How much do I expect Mark to spend over time? And what are the things I can do to influence that? That can give me revenue forecast data. And revenue is in gap accounting. That then means that um, business leaders, P&L owners, general managers, CFOs are paying attention to it where they aren't really to that kind of consolidated, discounted lifetime value. And oh, by the way, we don't have to have an argument over discount rates. We don't have to have an argument over variable contribution. Like we can just, we can forecast out groups of customers likely purchase value, volumes and values over time. And that becomes a driver of, or of, of revenue forecasting. And then similarly, we can do service intensity, we can do price realization, you know, all the things that would then lead to profit, um, drivers of um, operational cost, which are budgets that people manage. And so I've kind of come to this conclusion that eventually we'll get good at CLV modeling, but it's been around for 30 something years. And it's not commonly used by finance organizations. We can fight that battle all day. We, mm. We'll lose it. We'll lose it all over and over again. But as, as CX professionals, if we're really good at forecasting revenue and cost, we're yeah. Going. yeah. And also what, what I heard you say in that is that um, your thinking should be not so much around a common metric like CLV, but it should be around the thinking of the of the key stakeholders, in this case, finance, and what matters to them. And in this case, if you can attack, if you can link whatever you're measuring to things like revenue or cost, those are things that um, they're very tangible and and to the extent your data is accurate, inarguable. Instead of fighting for a new way of looking at the business's financial performance, hmm. why don't we get better at predicting? the financial performance in the language and format yeah. that people are used to using. And, and it's not just finance. It's not just CFOs. It's, it's also business unit leaders and the people who actually control the resource allocation and investment and strategy. We, we need to be speaking their language and using their currency as opposed to trying to convince them to pay attention to a new one. Eventually we'll get there. But let's start. Let's let's actually start with uh, something we can accomplish. Given the fact that you're you're the one speaking, how does all this relate to Net Promoter um, and the key stakeholders? And you know, I, I think it's as as gu a guilty practitioner in the past myself. I'm trying to educate, you know, infiltrate NPS into the organization, and as a as a common language uh, method and what, what are your thoughts about that as it relates to the conversation we just had? How long do you have? Um, <laughs> we, we, so the net promoter score was developed as a way of understanding both individual and groups of customers, um, future purchase and profitability driving behavior. Like if you go back and you, you really, people lose sight of this. They think it's all about recommendations. What we were trying to do is for cohort, large groups of customers, find a single question, the answer to which would help predict the likely repeat purchase and retention, um, cross sell, upsell, price realization, referral behavior, and even cost to serve. We want if we could find one question that would that would help us predict all of those things reasonably well, then we'd have something simple and that we could communicate to everybody from the senior level all the way to the front line that would be simple. And we did not start with this idea of a net score. We started with actually um, a scale of you know 
and, and we didn't care what the scale was. We didn't care what the question was. We just wanted, if you were going to ask one question that would predict the drivers of customer lifetime value, what question would that be and how hmm. would you ask? And that's what led to the choice of likelihood to recommend, which was the most predictive in the most industries that we looked at. There were others in other in some industries that were a little better, but they were only marginally better. We, we settled on the zero to 10 scale after experimenting because we found that having zero as an anchor, everybody understands zero is not good and right. therefore 10 must be good. So we didn't get people confusing the, sure. the scale as much. It, was, it went all the way to 10, not five be, or seven because what we found was that we had so many people at the top end of the scale. We needed to differentiate at that level Mm. to get the difference between satisfied and advocacy or commitment or what was the, the, the word that you were talking about with uh, Oliver's work? Um, um, cognitive and then action. The action, so, right. Like so, action. Yeah. Yeah. So we weren't using con his work, mm. but the, that we were trying to get to that level. So that's, mm. that, that's the differentiation. And the only reason we went to a net score was, well, actually there were two reasons we went to the net score. One is because empirically it turned out when we were looking at companies and trying to compare their performance, we found that the net promoter score relative to each was a good predictor of relative growth rates, revenue growth rates at the company level. Um, but also this idea, net profit, net promoter, it actually kind of intuitively appealed to people and it made it a, a reasonably simple thing. Yeah. Long-winded way of saying um, the reason net promoter is effective is because it's grounded in the drivers of financial performance. That's what it was intended to do. And that's what it generally does when you do it right. That's what it generally does reasonably well in almost every company we've looked at. So you want more promoters because you want more people who are buying more, staying longer, telling their friends, forgiving you when there are issues and, and problems. And you want fewer detractors because you want fewer people who are fleeing for competitors and occasionally convincing other people not to do this. That's, it, it ties to economic performance. Well, unfortunately, we have come to the end of our time for this part one of a two-part series with one of my favorite people of all time, Rob Markey. So many gems, so much insight, and we'll continue that in part two. Be sure and catch it on the Delighted Customers podcast. That's all for now. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for listening to the Delighted Customers podcast. I'd like to ask you a favor. If you have enjoyed this episode or any of my other ones, hit subscribe or follow. I've got a lot of other great guests that are coming up and a lot of other great content, and I don't want you to miss anything. You can find any links or references on the show in the show notes, and you can find those on my website at empoweredcx.com. <laughs>